Because this is episode, what, we're episode six now, right? This is episode six. Episode six of the Tech Emotion Podcast. We're doing another awesome interview I'm excited about today, which is with Michael Crump. Crump, this is your camera. I call him Crump. His name is Michael. He'll tell you what he wants you to call him in a second. But if you want to speak to the audience, there you go. And uh, yeah, we're uh, Michael is a lot of things in the industry. Just saying what he is for me personally, he's been a mentor of mine and just a very close, like a brother for a considerable amount of years now, since I think your youngest son was born. So it's been a long time. Uh, and having him on the podcast is really cool for me because he's seen my career progress over the last like about a decade. And I've seen him go through a bunch of stuff and he's exposed me to a bunch of things. So part of this podcast is really just exposing people to conversations that they may not be able to have in day-to-day -day life. So why don't you give the people just an introduction on yourself and what you do, all that fun stuff. Uh, sure. So like you said, it's uh, you know, Michael. It's fine. Uh, Crump. And uh, yeah, I've, uh, I think, uh, as you said, we'll take this as a moment to reflect on, for me, I guess, the last... Uh, 24 to 25 years right so um you know and there's more than just the resume to the story and mm -hmm. um but i think for anyone that has gotten to this point where you're in your early 40s right you're you're, you're, you're kind of in the middle of your career mm -hmm. right and um it's okay to look back right but you got to still keep looking forward and that's I see a lot of folks in their 40s start checking out and they just want the job that they're going to know that they're going to do mm -hmm. or at least by 50 so that they can ride off to the sunset, <laughs> let's say. But uh, others cannot. You just stay driven. And uh, that is probably one thing that I've always been is driven. Mm -hmm. um, to do what? I have no idea. <laughs> Something. Just the next thing that I, I, I found that I enjoy to create things. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I absolutely never intended on getting into tech. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> as you, as you, right? Yeah. Absolutely not. I remember <laughs> in high school taking a programming class, uh, and that was only because I transferred high schools and I had like 3D animation in that class, which was more like building GIFs back mm -hmm. then. <laughs> but. I go to this programming class at this other school and it was the if to the ends and the else. I'm like, good, I don't want to get out of here. I want this. <laughs> like, it sucks. <laughs> and mind you, that was back in 95. So it's not like you had any like whiz bang programming stuff, right? Yeah. The internet mm -hmm. was barely a thing. Um, so yeah, when I finished school and when I started going to college, I was going for uh, business administration mm -hmm. with a minor in journalism. Mm, yeah. I wanted to get into broadcast of some sort, not necessarily in front of the you screen. You pick this a little closer to your mouth. Yeah. So it's going to, yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not necessarily in front of the screen, but mm -hmm. if I needed to. Um, and even then, I you know enjoyed some of the soft skills that are needed for a business, like public speaking and organization and, and being creative, right? So I felt like I... I, I off ramps from high school into college, which I didn't finish, right, um, for business mm -hmm. and journalism. And I kind of felt like, okay, that was the direction I was going to go in. Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be some on type of entrepreneur. As soon as I turned 18, um, I went to the local city and registered my business. Mm -hmm. Had learned that, you know, if you use your own name, you didn't need a fictitious name license in Southwest Florida. So it was Michael Crump Universal Advertising, or <laughs> MKUA. Okay. The idea was to produce TV commercials, radio commercials, newspaper ads, magazine ads, design. Again, web really wasn't a thing, mm -hmm. but then it kind of was, and people were starting to get into it. Yeah. So I graduated high school in 97. Started college, so by 98, and I'm out there kind of beating the street while also in college and also having a full-time job, but kind of got an office, went out there, but really was trying to make MKUA into something and everybody kept saying they wanted websites. Mm. Hmm. I'm like, I don't know how to make websites. It was even then, like 
No. I'm not wrong on my websites. What year was this? 98. 98. Um, so, because I was more of a design guy, at least mm-hmm. the way I liked marketing, um, and uh, so I, I moved towards more of the WYSIWYG stuff, and the only ones that were good at the time was one called Net Objects Fusion, mm-hmm. had mixed results, mm-hmm. but at the time it was pretty cutting edge, you know, because it basically you would design, it would generate your pages, okay. and then you would publish all of those pages, that whole web project. Mm-hmm. And this WYSIWYG term for the people watching, that's like, they, they would think of like something like a WordPress that's what or I was something thinking. Like, like that. Yeah, you know, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. yeah, just kind of basic, like, table mm-hmm. layout yeah. stuff, right? Um, and then um, when I got my first customer that wanted an e-commerce website, which now this requires programming, but it was going to pay well. Mm-hmm. And this is still 99 so I grabbed a software called uh, Elemental Drumbeat. Never and heard of they it. were pretty <laughs> cutting edge at the mm-hmm. time. Well, let me tell, I'll tell you this. If folks who know, know that Elemental Drumbeat then was bought out by Macromedia. Macromedia Drumbeat then. And then later, everybody knew Macromedia from Flash. They had the Flash, you know, Flash uh, technology. Yeah. Right? So Macromedia then got bought out by Adobe. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Even while they had Macromedia, Drumbeat became Macromedia Drumbeat, and then later went away and became Macromedia Dreamweaver. Okay. okay. And then later, Adobe acquired, of course, now it's Adobe Dreamweaver. Yeah. Hmm. So the elemental Drumbeat software that we used back in 99, you know, has some traceability all the way. Exactly. Yeah. You know, to the latest products. Um, so I was able to do... Uh, that was an e-commerce site. We got online, e-commerce selling um, furniture from manufacturers that would drop ship. The lady I was working for, she made all these arrangements. This was all brand new stuff, right? That really hadn't been done yet uh, before. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she's making the business relationships. And so I was just kind of making this thing happen. And Elemental had an e-commerce engine. Uh, that's the only reason I switched because NetObjects at the time couldn't keep up with the volume. Um, and uh, I think it was that was my first foray into having to learn the data. Because hmm. now I had to learn products and that kind of meta model of data. Hmm. Um, again, first foray as in I didn't go to school for computers. <laughs> right? <laughs> So yep. this was a have to learn when you need to learn right there on the spot. Mm-hmm. And this time period, this is very like the height of the dot-com bubble era. This is, well, mind you, I lived at the time in Southwest Florida, Cape Coral, Mm -hmm. Fort Myers. No dot-com bubble, anything was going on in Cape (laughs) Coral, Fort Myers. Uh Um, There were companies that were dabbling, but no, no, no. It wasn't the big investor dot-com big bubble. Mm, Now, January 1st, 2000, all right, the millennium, Mm-hmm. It was actually the day that uh, my fiance at the time, well, girlfriend at the time, later fiance and now wife, but uh, we moved down to Miami. Mm. And mind you, before we moved to Miami, we went there for her to go to FIU to continue on in school. And I, I already had dropped out of college. Mm-hmm. And so I went from one side of the state, struggling as a student, barely making 18 grand a year or whatever it was back then. Right. Mm -hmm. And moved across the state. Now the dot com bubble, like I just like entered the bubble. Mm I had no idea all this stuff was going on. (laughs) I was so out of touch. (laughs) This was completely happenstance. And at that time, if you barely whispered that you knew HTML, they'd grab you up, Mm -hmm. put you in a row, go. That's how it was. Right. Mm. And um, so when folks were like, oh, I see on your resume that uh, you did e commerce and you did this. Oh, man, you've got. I'm like, I have no, all of, this <laughs> software did it for me. I really didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then as soon as you learn some HTML and you learn a bit of the data, so then you got popped into these roles. And again, in 2000, I was 20 years old, now making over 90 grand a year mm-hmm. from moving one coast to the other, right? So the bubbles were happening in pockets, not everywhere, okay. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to be introduced into tech into that. 
Um, if we hadn't moved, would I still get into technology? Possibly, but not so much on an engineering tip as mm. I, the diversion that it took. It probably would have gone more business, right? Mm. However, as I was then doing these contracts in Miami, sometimes they were three months, sometimes they were two months. And, you, mm. and it wasn't because that was the contract. Sometimes you just show up and the dot com close their doors and you put out your resume and you have another job in two, three days. Like, mm, it's wow. fast, right? It's, it was literally grab anybody. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say that I knew what I was doing, <laughs> but I will say I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, you knew so, enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, knew enough, and it was a combination how, of that with timing. It's yeah. all great. However, getting involved when things are that hot, right, especially in an industry, especially when you're living in Miami and you got all these places to spend the money mm -hmm. and then you got roommates mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like, dude, you could be making this money too. Come over here. Just let me show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. So I did that with a buddy of mine. We have been longtime friends and uh, we moved over to Miami together and, um, you know, we sat down and worked on some stuff, banged out some stuff. He knew CAD, so he wasn't um, completely out of touch, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a learning curve for him. And I was at a dot com. I'm like, yep, I got my roommate. You know, there was like they were literally grabbing anybody. I'm like, yep, my roommate just hired him now. Boom, he was hired. He shows up. He's like, Michael, why am I here? <laughs> I'm like, doesn't matter. Just sit and <laughs> learn. But remember, Google's in the search engines. We were still in the war of the search engines, right? So mm -hmm. none of them were really any good yet, right? So, so the ability to cheat via code, like Google search, really wasn't quite there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had to know the forums to go on to and Copy. put out there, hey, this is what I'm doing, or search the form, and someone else probably had that. Like, you knew, all right, I'm going to go this form, and this form, and this form, and this form, right? That's, uh, right. that's really how you would grab on to. Kind of um, making yeah. your own Reddit board yeah. of sorts. Right. Your own <laughs> stack overflow. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Like piecing it together yourself. Mm -hmm. There but, was one, I think it's still around, that did uh, bloom a little later call, that I used a lot called Experts Exchange. And at that one... That was a couple years later. I'm going to give them a little plug if they're still around. But um, that was a cool community because you got points for answering questions. And if uh. somebody clicked yes, that answered my question, you got points. Hmm. And then, like, our whole, like, software level floor, like, we were all competing to answer yeah. people's questions. <laughs> had nothing to do. So then, you know, you were going over to, like, the basic forums and answering their questions and mm -hmm. getting their points. But people had to buy the points hmm. to then offer points. To get the question answered, I don't exactly. know if they still do that, but it was it was a lot of fun. Yes, you know when you were getting a tech because you could play with their code, take their code, debug it, give it back to them, score some points. Oh, uh, that's cool. Um, anyway, so back to Miami, you know I had work done work with a Latin American um, uh, like uh, ESPN. It was called Sports Ya. Uh, that came and went. It was interesting. Uh, that was my first job on South Beach. Uh, did another one for a Latin American, uh, like a women's magazine, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Davina.com was what it was, uh, led by the CEO, I believe was, I want to say this right, either Academy or one of the awards she had won for writing, and so she had a lot of backing, and mm -hmm. that was a cool project, that one um, uh, built up, and then, you know, like a lot of things, um, it was a lot of churn during that time. But mm -hmm. right after that, the reason I remember them so specifically is right after that, I got scooped up um, by uh, Proficient. Hmm. Mm. Now, Proficient's not, still around. Yeah. Not the same Proficient. <laughs> really? Trust different me. Proficient? Very much different. They were oh, headquarters wow. at Austin, Texas at the time. Okay. And um, I got hired in as a senior consultant for Plumtree. Hmm. Basically then, even through Proficient, Proficient had more of a consulting feel to it at the time, but we would go in white label. So Plumtree business cards, Plumtree email, we are Plumtree as far as the customers were concerned. Mm -hmm. So staff log for them, but with like specialist, right? Gotcha. And when you come in through that kind of relationship, like you got to make a name for yourself so that, because mm -hmm. you're a higher bill rate. So you got to yeah. make sure they keep coming back to you as an expert. Solid. Well, my first engagement with Proficient was out at a company called USI 
in Annapolis, Maryland, mm -hmm. right? And I went out there. I wasn't yet 21 yet. I couldn't even rent a car <laughs> to go to the assignment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it was a whole thing. I, anyway, to me, that told me, for a, you know, this was going to be the start of a long career of always being the youngest guy in the room. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know that feeling. Right. Yep. And because um, I get there, that project was really interesting. I don't know if we have time for, for that s story, but mm. it, I want to say Plumtree, for those who knew it, and, it, and it's probably still around um, somewhere. Uh, some companies still have it, uh, but it was, a, it was the corporate portal software of the time. SharePoint wasn't even a thing yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, you barely had Exchange. Exchange 2000 had really just come out, gotcha. right? Um, and even still, when they had SharePoint, it was basically an overglorified folder structure. Mm -hmm. And so they were still looking to how to make SharePoint. Plumtree then wanted to support Microsoft with Exchange 2000, which was a big push for them, to work inside a plum tree. And plum tree said, yeah, we can do that. Microsoft said, yeah, we could do that. But then when they got to the thing, they're like, okay, the guys that are here, they can't get it done. So they kicked them out. Mm -hmm. And then they asked the proficient guys, hey, who can do this? I'm like, huh, I worked on email systems before. Sure, I can do it. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going myself <laughs> into. But, um, It's funny, those end up turning into like the best opportunities. It was. I had no idea, but yeah, let me try it out. <laughs> Gotta scare yourself into <laughs> but, some learning sometime. But I can't take all the credit. It was uh, USI brought one of their uh, really, really good um, developers um, down from New York or New Jersey. And uh, we found underneath unpublished Exchange, Microsoft didn't even said it was available yet. We found their SOAP interface. And once mm -hmm. we found that, we were able to dig and find the XML and then create a component for Plumtree so that when you signed in, inside of your corporate dashboard, you'd have your email right there, like your latest mm. emails. Anyway, but from there, springboarded into doing engagements with the United Nations, the Secretary of Defense, Merrill oh, Lynch, wow. Johnson & Johnson, Kermit E, um, and so forth, where now, because I, I, I tackled this big hairy thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the worst going to happen? Let me go. I'm going to just go get another job, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the worst that's going to happen, right? Anyway, mm -hmm. so I gave it a shot, went out there. We figured it out. It was a almost a two-month engagement uh, for one piece of, that was never existed. But that was the exciting part. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And But from there, you gain the reputation, and then you start, you know. So every time you get a chance to face a challenge, it's like, Figure out, don't be nerve, you know, scared of it. Just think, what do I got to lose? No. What mm -hmm. is the risk, really? Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes we get too wrapped up in that. You know, I really like this, uh, this part of the story. For any non-traditional entrance into tech, mm -hmm. when, to me, because, you know, I think between that, we, we all have non-traditional entrances into tech pretty much. And I know a lot of people that have traditional entrances, but out of all the people who, who came in non-traditionally and were successful, there are multiple big kind of crucible moments that you come to where you have to figure it out. And it's funny, I even see the people who take the, non, the traditional path go through the same thing where they have their, their crucible moment, but they have even just as hard of a time as the people who have never learned anything because school didn't really prepare them as well as maybe it could have. Mm -hmm. Now, the ones that are good, they, they lean on their foundational principles that they learned in school and they figure this stuff out. Uh, but I, I want to just kind of focus on that for a second. For people who are interested, right? Because we're at the point in your story now where you went from, I didn't know anything about tech. I didn't even want to be in tech. <laughs> to now, one short year, all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden, in it? <laughs> and what year I'm in it, and now I'm getting to a, a very, a very kind of depth, getting to a depth inside of tech. Mm -hmm. At that part of your journey, for people who are interested in maybe taking the leap, not in tech currently, but want to go down, down that route, what advice would you give them for that part of the journey and how to handle those 
difficult crucible moments because they're ve- they're plentiful mm-hmm. in the beginning, almost constant, I would say. But what are your thoughts? You have to cut out the long pause, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. In the first five years of your career, especially as soon as you start getting into it, don't think that you're going after a title. And don't Mm -hmm. think, like, I got to be at that job to be successful. Uh, Don't try to define yourself with a title. If you find that tech is a big broad spectrum and you find you're not good at this thing that's okay Mm -hmm. right there's a whole bunch of stuff i'm not good at there's a lot of stuff that bores me to tears i'd rather not (laughs) do it Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's other stuff that's interesting but not all of us get to work on the interesting stuff all the time Mm -hmm. so um it's okay if you pivot right because i'll tell you what especially in the dot-com, the guys that ended up being successful or, or gals and, you know, um, were the ones that were like, all right, I'm gonna do this role. All right. That dot-com busted. And that was like, you're used to it. You did not take it personally. You're <laughs> on to the next boom, boom, boom. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was okay. Last one, I was a, uh, cold fusion programmer. Now I got to come over here and be a SQL programmer. And now I got to come over here and be a marketing guy. Uh, okay, sure. Whatever. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, go for it. Um, Try it out. But then anything you do, any work you do, as soon as you say, yes, I'll do that, commit and follow through, right? Mm -hmm. Just see it to the end and know that it's the work product that you put out there is your reputation. It's your work Mm -hmm. product that has your name on it. It's not all the stuff you think people think of you. It's not all the stuff that you think your reputation is. That has nothing to do with anything. It's your work product should speak for the quality that comes from you. And that's really what raises your value, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's not your hourly rate. It's not your salary. Um, and it's not your title. It's, mm-hmm. it's your output of whatever you're doing. You can, if you don't take pride in your work, your value is going to be very low. Mm-hmm. You said something interesting there. You said, as soon as you say yes to taking on something new, or some sort of project, as soon as you say yes, follow through. So experiment wide, but as soon as you commit, follow through. And what that's, is, what that's was more your of process? A, well, that's more, and that statement is more of a tactical thing. It's like, even when you take something, right, and you do the job, mm-hmm. be really good at that job. Yeah. And so even if you are moving from one thing to another or one role to another, you want the last folks to give you a referral mm-hmm. or reference and say, yeah, he did that really well. And mm-hmm. I think he's going to do really well at that because when this person started here, they didn't know this either. And man, they picked that up quick. Mm-hmm. And then within a year became my most productive person. So I'm sure they'll do the same thing for you. No, it's mm-hmm. interesting that now this... We've been drawing um, trends between the different episodes, discussions we've been having. Um, quality and care is one thing that has come up on multiple different occasions through these discussions. Um, when we talk about first between blockchain and AI and people just throwing a million different projects in the air, but we can tell you don't really care about a lot of them, which is why the quality of them are garbage. Mm-hmm. And then talking to um, David last week, when we were talking about sales, and it's the difference between the sales guy who's just talk, looking to talk to anybody but can't close deals or isn't trusted as that advisor when he goes into other places. The difference is, do you care about the customer? Do you care about what they care about and how that fosters the change there? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A, a quick thought or question I had to you, because you, you've seen two separate eras um, that of that the dot com bubble that we talked about, or um, that internet internet startup versus the current tech startup feel, and and how wide that gap of risk can feel. Where you said you, you kind of didn't take it personal. That dot com folds. Okay, cool. We move on to the next role. Okay, that didn't do it. Okay, we move on to the next role. Do you see any similarities between the that time period of that late nineties two thousands versus this startup era that we're in right now? Mm-hmm. 
had more to do with the people really and culture of people the willingness to be driven to work mm. right to get things done and take pride in your work mm. uh, i mean as a culture of people that has definitely gone down you know since then um <laughs> and it has made people aren't hiring just anybody anymore well, why do you say that why do you say that the quality people's desire to maintain the quality of there, the work is well, down. one there's way more jobs than there are people to fill them mm-hmm. right why that are people the case why are, then? What, um, yes and no back then mm-hmm. the they didn't the expectation of the role was much lower gotcha. than it is now hmm. right expectation is higher mostly because employers want a quality candidate it's not even a matter of length of experience. It's a matter of quality. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have time to babysit. <laughs> they got to keep no. trucking. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So when the recruiter doesn't do a good job bringing in the right, or the, if that person doesn't work out, they go back to the recruiter and be like, you didn't see this coming. Yeah. You who know? are you bringing me? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the difference is that, and just to kind of keep, reiterating that of those who do care those who put enough quality those who are driven enough to care right um yeah sometimes work doesn't stop at five o'clock mm-hmm. like sometimes you're still working on stuff right mm-hmm. um it's just the way it happens you know we've talked about that before on the podcast i i i wholeheartedly agree and i add some specifics on top of that so people know what i mean because people say oh you know you got to keep working you got to keep grinding and i agree with that i also believe that your employer shouldn't necessarily require more than 40 hours of work of work from you for employer related things but like for myself when i was put in 60 to 80 hour weeks unhealthy levels of work at the highest level i wasn't I would be inspired by the work I was doing during the day. And then I would identify gaps in my own knowledge that were associated to certain tech principles, whatever they were. And then what I was doing at night was learning those tech principles, but it wasn't a direct work task. It wasn't an item I was picking up from a backlog. Always have a side do. project. Yeah, Always it have was side projects. Have a side project. And this is th- that even has its own connotation now. People are like, you know, talking about, oh, how can I always be working on side projects? But it is necessary. No, your I own think. side project. And yeah. I have your stuff own for you. Yeah, I was going That's, to bring yes. that up because you know, where you're a self-made entrepreneur, you've had that that gene in you since the very beginning, based on this conversation. And we're in this hustle culture now, to where everybody's side projects they feel have to be lucrative like they or have to hits. make money they have to, it has to be that quick hit mm-hmm. but from what i'm taking from this it, it could just be a passion project it could be something that i remember you used to just take random languages and focus on something something to keep the brain turning yeah. um and it's not that these side projects always have to bring in money immediately mm-hmm. but it might be arming you with the skills you need moving forward to open those doors down the road yeah i would say you're at a I would give a dramatic number. Probably 95% of all of my side projects had nothing to do with making money. Hmm. It was all skill acquisition. Yeah. Because I knew that acquiring those skills would put me in a better position when I started my own business or when I went to advance in my current role with all of my future goals in mind. When you find you do something well, mm-hmm. capitalize on it. Mm. Like, ooh, this is my thing. I mm. do this thing really well. Um, what was your thing? What was your thing that you did really well and chose to capitalize on? I don't know if it's a natural talent or a developed talent just based on experience. So it's kind of hard to make it into a tangible thing. Hmm. Um, But um, I feel that at times I have a certain knack of seeing the trees from the forest and the forest Hmm. from the trees. 
-hmm. A lot of programmers can't see outside the screen, can't see outside the box. And again, because I, my focus has always been business mm -hmm. and or building businesses, mm -hmm. I see much broader view, but I still know how to do the tech. Mm -hmm. So it became rare that someone was a technologist, could code, mm -hmm. could do live code demonstrations, mm -hmm. and also have the C-level conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've had conversations about platform engineering or platform mm -hmm. architecture, pre-sales, mm -hmm. all that. Those who are successful in those roles are the people who have had experience in both, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so anytime that you can take maybe two skills that you have and put them together in a unique way, right? So even though I, like I said, early on took pride in public speaking, I kind of carried that through my career where I looked at opportunities to help train or get in front of customers. Mm. And then I became an asset where folks would want, you know, me to do that. Mm. Um, humility is key. Love this. Love where this mm -hmm. is going. <laughs> um, and so you probably see that I struggle talking about my own career sometimes. Mm -hmm. Unless I was in a job interview and I had very bulleted things to go through. Yeah. Well, this is an interview. Right. But, <laughs> well, you know, we are asking. But I'm not applying for anybody's job. So yeah, sure. um, they can apply to my job. <laughs> yeah. um, dot com bubble did crash. Mm -hmm. By the time it got to where I couldn't find a job, mm -hmm. and then I started selling cars because mm -hmm. there was no tech jobs. They were popped, right? Mm. Uh, this was pre-proficient or after-proficient? Pre? No, no, no. It was after. Yeah, yeah. After proficient. Yeah. Yeah. The dot-com bubble popped in 2001. It was already. I would say crumbling, fracturing before 9-11. Yeah. And mm -hmm. after 9-11, mm. just, you know, everything. So that that time I started selling cars. And so it's like, again, I, you just be humble. Like, I'm not going to sit at home and not mm -hmm. work. All right, I'm going to go sell cars. Or I'm going to go do this. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't stop, right? Um, many, many times in between jobs, you're doing another job. Like, you, whenever you stop, you're not working. Exactly. You're not mm -hmm. producing. Um, I only had to work there for two weeks, which was interesting. Um, I got a call f where, mind you, because I was traveling as a consultant, I was considering jobs all over the country. And so when I said that it had popped, I was applying at every any state all over the U.S. Like, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure everyone felt that same pain during that period mm -hmm. of time. Um, so I really didn't matter where. And heck, I was probably just putting my resume on everything at this point because mm -hmm. nothing was hidden. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Two weeks after I took the job as a car salesman, uh, which I learned a lot in those two weeks, um, so it was beneficial. Two weeks later, I got a call from a company back on the other coast that we came from, back in Cape Coral, the only software company that existed there at that time, which I had never heard of which had apparently been there for 20 years. Oh, wow. Mm. A little, little, little software company, but they had, um, they needed a CTO. I was 22 years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I thought the guy made a mistake calling me. <laughs> what do you mean he needs a CTO? Like, okay, and, 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 and how does that pay? That was my question. Yeah. <laughs> Like you just trying to do this and pay like something like way down here, but uh, I went over, I did the interview, but the thing was is that their tech at that time had not gone online yet. Mm -hmm. They were still that far behind to where even now that the bubble now popped, they were just starting gotcha. to get online. Mm -hmm. right? This one okay. software company. There. And I showed them work that I'd already done and all these other dot coms. Right, mm -hmm. and the owner and president of that company he goes, "All right, great, you got a job." <laughs> and he goes, "I want you to build me that." Go, All right. So I started with their skeleton crew. 
Um, we got up to about 30 people, half of those being software folks. Um, but remember, they already had an existing software business based on uh, Fox Pro. Mm. You probably never heard of it. I had never heard of it until then. Mm. Um, desktop application. Mm -hmm. And they were wanted to go online. And so I was given two programmers to get this project started, built a corporate portal that would rival Plumtree, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. <laughs> built that software from the ground up, integrated all of their software online. So now they have a completely new delivery package to sell to customers, hmm. where we had to script it down to like automated clicks. It was truly a software as a service after two years in uh, to that. We took it to market and then ended up selling it to a company out of Hong Kong. Hmm. Um, so that was my foray into more executive level, as in I got snatched up by a smaller company back on the other coast, which happened to be only a few weeks before I got married, hmm. <laughs> which we got married in Miami. And then my wife was still finishing college at FIU. So for the first time, we had to be apart for six months until she uh, finishes college. And I started hmm. the job on the other coast. Um, so that was a, that was a crazy time. Um, and that's, again, when I got married. So. Yeah. Sweet. Um, they're still together, by the way. Yeah. I yeah. Don't know. Uh, 22 <laughs> That's years. good context. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this year will be 22 years. Commitment. Congratulations. <laughs> Congrats. Mm. So the reason that I left that company, and it is very important that I bring up this point, because if you remember, I, w I had started the company MKUA, mm -hmm. and I still had this entrepreneur pool. And now after at that company for three years, I was getting real itchy. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to not only myself, but also the owner of that company, he gave me my first six customers as referrals. that got me kickstarted really. Oh wow. Because it kind of came out of him and I went for a business discussion evening and he wasn't able to get certain things done or able to sell certain things a certain way. And we both agreed that if I helped him as a consultant, as an outside company, and I build out this consultancy, that obviously I could help his customers, but obviously in the springboard and do other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I did. So I started up uh, uh, Intelligent Technology Integration, or ITI, mm -hmm. in Southwest Florida. Did it for two years in Florida as my only job, one-man show. Contracted some folks every now and then, but mostly a one-man show doing light programming, managed services, whatever needed to to bring the bills in. This was 2003. So even as a one-man show making net net 75 grand a year, it wasn't too bad, you know, mm -hmm. 23, 24. Yeah. Um, even back then, so just for yeah, inflation. Yeah, exactly. You know. But uh, moved, but it, all my customers were national at that point. It didn't matter where I lived. They weren't local. So we picked, that's when we, in 05, after the downturn and that recession, moved to Charlotte, picked this area just because it felt like it was still young and up and coming and Absolutely. tech and I needed to be more locally. I wasn't going to get it where I was in Southwest Florida. The mm -hmm. customers there were worried about paying for $2,000 for a website, mm -hmm. much less they couldn't even conceive of a $20,000 project that, exactly. you know, that you would do for a week. Um, so I knew compared to what I had done in Miami, I knew I didn't want to go back to Miami. It was just too much congestion. Um, it was hard not having, not being fluent in Spanish you know, mm. to navigate business in that area. Mm. Um, you have to rely heavily on partners that yeah. do speak it. Um, anyway, so we moved to Charlotte, still kept ITI going here for another year or so, but then we had that big downturn in 05, another recession. So I had customers not paying me for like 16,000 and 22,000 and like, that's a one man show. That's everything. That was it. So I had to go take a job. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't take me long. Uh, and I took over as a web systems manager for uh, one of the largest uh, real estate companies here in the Carolinas, and they continue to spread. So then it was my deeper, deeper dive into SQL mm. and ETL and automation and you know different data feeds. And it was kind of low level, wasn't too difficult, um, but uh, got a lot of hands-on time, let me say. Mm -hmm. And um, they were transitioning to a .NET uh, application. So obviously I had experience in that. And, uh, so I helped him with that, but also 
uh, Realtor.com really wasn't big yet. It had regular listings, but the click, drag, move the map around and the properties to come in didn't exist. Gotcha. Mm. And so we wanted to do that. And um, so I was able to develop that uh, with just me and then one other contractor we worked with in one guy, which really he did mostly the MLS stuff. And then the CIO, uh, I believe he's still there. He was very hands-on as well. So between the three of us, uh, we were able to build that map interface that brought the maps in um, via the Google API mm -hmm. and then came up, he came up with a great algorithm for the lat long that um, I still pay attention to reference still today uh, on other projects. But So you never know as you're going through your career, even though if, hey, I had to give up ITI for a little bit and I mm -hmm. took this job and it felt like a step down a little bit because now I'm reporting these other folks. Exactly. But, and then having to do a lot of hands-on. But I got to do some really interesting things. Exactly. Um, got to help them improve. Uh, I was able to reach out to their marketing department and work with them to help them improve um, you know, data and pushing of images and listings and all these things that just didn't exist. So um, that was a lot of good uh, experience there as well. I could continue all the way up, you know, yeah, to, but yeah. you know, really after that, I took the role as senior manager of it architecture at a pharmaceutical services company here. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I had a team of architects. And so now I was able to take kind of all that experience and it's like, I still didn't know where my skills really landed or if it had a label. And then once I found architecture in the true sense of the term of the practice, TOGAF, all of it, like I felt like, ooh, now I'm home. Like it was the marrying of business and technology together, expressing it in a creative way so that others can understand the viewpoint of the story that you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. If you don't look at architecture that way as a communication tool, and if architects don't take pride in that as a communication tool, they're not, in my mind, really architects, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in doing that, again, a job I had never done before. <laughs> I'd never necessarily even been an architect before, but mm -hmm. I got that job because I did a show and tell presentation Again, leveraging more of my presentation skills, to public right, speaking right. sales skills. And I basically pulled content for Microsoft Solutions Framework, pulled content from TOGAF, put it together in a way. I said, okay, this, you know, I don't know your organization, but you wanted me to show you what an industry standard looks like. Here you go. That's how I got that role. Mm -hmm. um, and they just needed somebody to organize these folks. Uh, but what that experience taught me, because mind you, when you're coming in as a manager of a team of architects, these guys are already the best in that organization. They're already the smartest guys. And you're gonna tell them what to do, <laughs> right? That's a tough group, right? Which it, guys are the best? You know, architects, you oh, know, okay. in the organization. The guys that should be, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, cause my experience, they're not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Should, should in like modern day, Well, the they thing don't is, seem to be the best. Well, here, well here's, <laughs> Well, here's also what I found in entering this is, mm -hmm. which I say many times is a lot of times developers will move up their career stack and they've been a senior this and a senior that. And if they don't want to go to management, we don't know what to call them anymore. So we're going to mm -hmm. call them an architect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so not to take away that these guys, these folks are super sharp, very good. They've gone up the career path. They've got the experience. However, there is a such thing as the practice of architecture. It mm -hmm. in and of itself is a very specialized role, right? And if you don't go into that, into it, just like I said earlier, committing to it and really putting quality behind it, um, mm -hmm. you're not gonna serve anyone well, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of architects I'd run into that like to just talk, be the consultant, mm -hmm. but we'll never make a diagram ever. Mm -hmm. There's others that will over diagram everything mm -hmm. for every single task, right? That's over. That's too much. So what are your thoughts on like the whole ivory tower architecture? 
deal. You know, for those. I say, you know, you're gonna know, have to break right? that down yeah. for me. Come on, man. That's so a this, whole, this is whole that's a whole another. That could be an hour conversation. I could do a talk on that. Enterprise relax. architects, right? Because like I've been on dev, and then I was hired as a cloud architect or whatever. But it felt more like an SRE type role uh, that they called. Mind you, we still haven't talked about another like eight nine years of my career. Oh yeah, we're just yeah, we're gonna we gonna jump. Yeah, we're, jump, we're, we're, we're jumping in on this. This this is interesting though. So my issue. And what I hear people say and what I've experienced is ivory tower architecture when you have these this group of enterprise architects in a room deciding on what technology a company is going to use when they're extremely out of touch as to what it means to use this technology. Hence making decisions. And they're making decisions for what the developers and what the development teams are going to do Uh, instead of allowing them to decide. Gotcha. It used to be a lot more like that and there's been a shift where now it's more so like the architect, I think the best architecting organizations, and I'm curious your thoughts on this too, decide the principles and the standards we adhere by regardless of the tool that we're adopting. But they allow within a, a more a looser boundary the development teams to decide what specific tech tools they will use to compose a given solution that's my experience so and i've been really annoyed by ivory tower architects who don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> but but have a piece of paper and a diagram that says well you know we met with all these vendors and we think this is the right way to go so i'm curious as to your thought on that um there's no such thing as an ivory tower. Hmm. I say that as to say is uh, the folks who are in that role might think they're in one, but it's an illusion. I say that because they have a lot of latitude to define their role and a lot of latitude to say how tactical or strategic they're going to be involved in helping to drive technology decisions. Right. Are you talking about the architects I'm or, talking about the enterprise, or the I'm talking about the devs. enterprise architects. They're, see, right. I wouldn't think that they would think they're in it. Usually the people in the ivory tower don't think they're in the ivory tower. Usually it's the people that are the victims of the ivory tower no, no, <laughs> that no. I see that make a comment of like, oh, they think they're in this well, ivory tower. Again, communication. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, either way, it's still an illusion okay. for the developer or for the architect. Like, there's no such thing. Okay. Here's why I explain that. Um, let's admit that a lot of folks are probably calling their roles the wrong things, <laughs> even based on the work that they're actually doing. There are folks that are project managers that are acting like BAs. Mm-hmm. There are developers that act more like DBAs. There's going to be architects that act more like consultants and then there's there's going to be architects that produce output and contribute to value and follow through and make sure that that value is seen right? so role versus responsibility there's that yeah. right but own your role so if you're a project mm. manager be a project manager and if you're like hey what if i don't do this ba thing no one else is going to do it no 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 you're a project manager you need to be the guy to call out that that BA thing is not happening and you mm-hmm. need the BA thing to happen, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Architect, you're, you should have certain expectations of the architect, right? Yep. Architect, I'm going to engage you. The reason I'm engaging you is for this and I need this value out of your contribution. Mm-hmm. If so that a, isn't what's happening- engagement? What's a good architecture engagement look like? Scenario, I'm a dev. Well, let's, let me, let me go back to the other, uh, maybe I'll, I'll paint this out. That's a good follow-up question. I'll paint it all into one nice composite picture. Cool. So now that I've destroyed the idea pictorially of an ivory tower, how it should work, right? Are more, think of it more like a framework of uh, layers, right? Of a cake or just layers of a swim lane, however. Mm-hmm. Uh, enterprise architects have one certain role, but they shouldn't mm-hmm. be playing all the roles down the chain. 
meaning there are other architects that have other specialties, right? Mm -hmm. However, for any one of those other architects, meaning an application architect, data architect, uh, you know, IT architect, um, platform architects, right? So they got these different specialties, but for somebody to become an enterprise architect, they need to understand all the different domains, mm -hmm. right? Not from a super deep technical perspective, but you sure as heck better not be lost in the conversation. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be an enterprise architect, it is your absolute role to help align steer technology to meet business goals. The core premise of an architect, its main value is to say, here's my current state, here's the future state you're trying to get to. Now I can draw a picture that will demonstrate those two things. A lot of architects think that this is their only deliverable. It's not. The main value for the architect is to design the transition plan, how I'm going to get here from here to here. Just like an architect for a building says, okay, right now you've got a flat piece of land. Here's the building you're going to draw. This is the future state. Here you go. That is, no, no. Architect mm -hmm. has to obviously show in blueprints. You see it in layers, right? And it shows different pieces. All right, here's this piece and here's this piece and here's this piece. Here's how you layer based on the perspective of the f trade that is engaging to achieve that final goal of building that building. So the same thing for any architect, their value is never in that output of the future state deliverable that so many of them focus on. It's in the transition. Now, when you talked about architects that are pushing down or dictating things, and feel like they're going like this downwards, right? Um, there should be more collaboration. Now we get into what should it look like. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna lean over on this direction here, <laughs> right? In a real, true, agile methodology, the architects have gotten involved during the discovery phase. Absolutely. Right? They have helped to draw the picture of the future state while the business was talking about it. Mm -hmm. It is really their job to work side by side with the BAs to, to help all the rest of the technical piece of the organization to say, how are we going to accomplish those goals? Mm -hmm. Right? So now of course we got our epics and then we're getting into our sprints, right? Architects don't need to be involved in all that planning, but then, we have this plan of this is the thing inside of your individual agile sprints, you're going to have some senior folks, mm -hmm. leads, and then devs. It would be the leads job to say, wait a minute, this thing is different. This request is custom, right? I always say, is it custom? Is it configuration or is it just some kind of like script? Mm -hmm. If it's a script, or a configuration, an architect doesn't need to be involved. I don't need to draw a UML diagram just for your configuration. That's just a out of the box thing. Yeah. But then as soon as the lead says, hey, this thing is custom and it's, I'm not quite sure how this is gonna fit into the future state diagram, they need to engage the architect okay. to come in. But as soon as the architect is engaged, it needs to be clear, do I just need you for a consult? Mm -hmm. Do I need you to do an output document? and it should be focused on the unit of change. Now, as those iterations are happening, and as it's building, right? Of course the architect, enterprise architect should be kind of poking their head in. Exactly. How's testing going, right? In a true SDLC framework in a more modern way where architecture and development are folding together nicely, they need to become super best friends with UAT testing folks. Mm -hmm. so that it's the architects that drive the testers to create their test based on this diagram and what's supposed to happen. Really interesting. And mm -hmm. then, then they're working on their code to, write, to meet the test, right? DDD, but we don't have to call it that. All we need to call it is putting UAT and testing front and center before it even comes into dev. Like dev mm -hmm. shouldn't even be looking at it until test created their test cases, mm -hmm. right? that says that you agree, I agree, you agree, we're all good. We're testing to this because this is the diagram. This is what we're gonna do, cool. 
Now devs can go program their hearts out. Mm -hmm. However you want to accomplish that thing. That's such an interesting thought because what you were describing previously, that's, that's in my experience, more understood than it is applied, right? Like even SAFE has um, what they call the infrastructure roadmap that architects at the high level put into place before we can even start a PI. And now they, they've laid the trail, the train tracks so that we are, we stay on focus moving forward. But the idea of architects being involved in the testing is, is a new concept for me it, personally. It, again, you got to pull the testing yeah. way forward. It's happening way too late. Yeah. And it's usually happening in sprints after the fact has already Absolutely. happened. Absolutely. And you're building tech debt. Absolutely. See, I, right I, from the get go. I agree with you in this description that I can't help but get continue getting the feeling that this is some description of a utopian society of architecture. Like compared to what actually happens. For sure. Yeah. Is yeah, it, like now mind always you, a goal. What to I explained towards. to you is yeah. uh uh, like that's Michael ideal. Crump, copyright 2023. Yeah, right? I love this that. I love it. This but isn't. This is. If you're seeing this clip, topic. this is yeah. you know, this is the Michael Crump utopian architecture. No, yeah, I will tell you at, maybe at the end of the story <laughs> why I've come up with this. No, I, and I agree. I agree with the ideas, right? But there, there are people. There are organizations. I'm not going to say there are organizations writing software at a very high level that aren't doing any of that. That are producing, and they're probably not even doing agile right then either. So, yeah, no, no I'm so. not disagreeing. I think the ideas that of that agile. For, first of all, which agile are we even choosing? Are you know, are like, are we doing Scrum? Are we doing Safe? Are we like, who do we even have doing what? Like, well, for you know, what unnecessary meeting am I having this week? Like, I don't know. See, here we go. But the like, and look, in organizations it like that, back to the meetings, you have thirty to fifty people on every single call. Well, because man. no one takes the accountability. And they need the business and the architects to walk them through every single step of the way. And it becomes a huge planning session before we pull the trigger to start dev, which is goes against everything we do in Agile, right? See, I, I see do want to and architects, here. good architects, should be a good enabler for Agile. They I, should be a driving force yeah. behind the momentum that Agile can get to. Mm -hmm. I think that the level of a, of a bank or of like no. some massive no. institution, all of this stuff makes a lot of sense. The, I'm talking about at a product level, got to keep it focused at a product level. Enterprise is yeah. up here, yes, but at, at a product strategy, vision, and all the products that need to align to that. Mm -hmm. You got to remember the enterprise architects aren't just making decisions on one project, two projects. They're thinking about all 200 that got underneath the portfolio, mm -hmm. right? And so when they are making exceptions or standards, I agree with what you're saying is maybe the standard shouldn't be a labeled vendor software. The standard should be a mm -hmm. technical specification. Yeah. As in any software you use, if as long as it meets that specification, we're good. So clear yeah, that conversation. Specifically around things that would burn the entire house down. Like the... The well, best, that comes back to doing SRE and resilient architecture in the first yes, place. Yes, like there's a lot of stuff to prevent that. And I think that a lot of the EA teams now, the modern EA teams that I'm seeing that are really good, have a lot of that baked in. A lot of the SRE type skill set, a lot of the platform engineering and architecture skill sets and can actually do the work and not just pontificate, which I think is where a lot of the ivory tower idea comes from is like you get in a room or a meeting and there's a lot of pontification, people talking and whiteboarding that, that aren't actually doing the work. Exactly. And so there's this loss of respect between the teams that are doing the work and the teams that are supposed to define how we do the work. And it causes this friction. But you it's also it not that. an architect's job to decide how they do their work. Exactly. All they can do yeah. is set standards. But if you're it's deciding what tools you use, like if I said, come in and say, you can only use this type of screwdriver. That's, it's pretty hard for me to understand how that's not deciding how I do the work. I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling some PTSD. 100%. Yeah. Oh, but to, oh, yeah. I've experienced <laughs> but, a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but even to that point, which is a, another um, tweak of this conversation, I'd be interested to hear both of your opinions on mm -hmm. the overworking of a typical architect, in my personal opinion, because they're on a million different projects. And by the time that you pull them back into something, but what kind of architect like, are we talking about? 
Yeah. I've seen this at all different, whether they're the, the enterprise level, whether I mean, they're. What I'm saying is organizations will just call them an architect. Solid. And don't give them a domain specialty and say, this is an application architect. This is a mm -hmm. data architect, right? And when you say, we overuse the word solution architect. I was just about, uh, that's because yeah. yeah. that's typically Heavily. the that term. Became that became a made I, up yeah. term. But yeah. that's how it happens. Like, uh, previous... like I just need a guy that's going to like draw the whole solution for me. And, and yep. then that's what they do. And then okay. we start building. They haven't seen and looked at this product in months because they've been drawing diagrams for everybody under the sun. And then they pop up on our team in four months. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You weren't supposed to do that. Hey, but we followed the program, the, the diagram you gave us four months ago. Well, yeah, yeah. But that's not the chance. Well, when were we were going to find out that that's no longer the standard here? Yeah. And that's that's the experience that I'm having. Like I love the ideas behind. Well, then that was a failure from the architect on your project. Yeah, agreed, and, I, and and that's my point is that there are so many failures on the like architecture to me in the this ideal way that we're talking about it is a leadership space. It's a space where you have to lead in these technical decision the technical decision making process as a whole for an organization and, and trickling down to dev teams. Mm -hmm. But dev teams now, because of Agile, are working in much shorter increments of time and producing units that are going out much faster. So if you have an enterprise architect or any type of architect who's over a portfolio of 200 products, they're not going to be able to be plugged in the way that they might be needed as, you know, in that leadership capacity. And that's mm -hmm. to me where it breaks down. It breaks down not because there's something wrong with the approach of architecture. It still feels like you don't have enough architects. Well, yeah, yeah but you also like can't find enough architects. Or you're not like, delegating. But again, <laughs> you get a higher people. right for the specialty mm -hmm. and um, treat architecture as a practice. Just like any other role in the organization, you should have expectations of it and clearly define outputs that that role is supposed to be producing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Architects find really good ways. We find really good ways of like getting out of that. <laughs> um, yet there are too many architects that also feel like they're the smartest guy in the room. It's, it's tough. Like Without I, it's tough. the humility side of realizing I'm an architect probably because I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. And as soon as I stepped into architecture, I slowly stopped doing it every day. And I may not be as quick, fast. The more time I spend in architecture, I may not be as in the know of how this new tech works for sure. Right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to rely on some folks. It's okay. Yeah. It's, that's big. It, it, that, that's a huge point. Like, and I think the collaboration because of ego, which ego and yes. tech is just nuts across everybody, dev and architecture included, because those are the two main personas I've been talking about. But like the best experiences I've had with architecture has been that collaborative experience where you get in a room with an architect. The architect is like, hey, I found all these things. These are my diagram. This is what our concerns are, right? And then the dev team can be like, oh, okay, we understand the concerns. This part of this architecture though is gonna be an issue because you know you made some assumptions here because you ha aren't hands on all the time. So could we adjust this and what would make it you know feasible for us to push on here and push on there while still meeting corporate standards? Those are the best conversations. But when you get into a conversation and you have the ego on either side, as a dev to not be willing to concede your point and do what's best for the organization as a whole. And as an architect, not being able to uh, concede and pull back where you can because you feel like you put so much work and the dev team doesn't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You need both sides to have a great architecture and dev experience. Humility yeah. on both sides. Well, there's two books that I think every architect should read and they have more to do with soft skills than they do anything else hmm. um, let the people know indeed <laughs> uh, what was it uh, ego is the enemy oh yeah mm -hmm. love it love that book and uh, the one I absolutely tell everyone to read is 360 degree leader mm. uh, one, more, one more time though, you 360 said. degree leader gotcha. I only read part of it so that's an older one 
It is. It's John, been out he, for a he's while. Still, he just put out another book just now on communication. Mm. Like 10 facts or 10 something. I don't know. He has a lot of books, right? Mm-hmm. But the 360-degree leader is the one that really says no matter where you are in the role, you can lead up. You mm-hmm. can lead to the side. You don't have to necessarily lead down. Mm-hmm. But you need to know how to do that well, too. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really always, I really enjoy all his stuff. It's really, really good. I will also say that um, every technologist, no matter where you are in IT, always be coaching someone else. Mm-hmm. All right, so we talked, you mentioned that in the beginning. Wanted to bring the conversation kind of forward mm-hmm. to where, you remember I said even in college days, right? I always had, you know, had my roommate next to me. And then a couple years later, it'd be someone else. And then someone else. And over your career, if you're always coaching somebody, right? And then you see them go off and they go, you know, in their trade and it, the lifestyle change for them, you will, it is great, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing more rewarding than that. Indeed. Um, and it got to a point, though, where I had two or three people come in the house, and I was doing whiteboards, and um, got to where, you know, folks would come to me, and they've got some eight-year-old jacked-up laptop. I'm like, dude, you can't learn on that. So I'd go mm-hmm. buy him a laptop. I'm like, you know what? Just pay me back when you get the job mm-hmm. um, or whatever. And um, so after a while, I was like, man, it's costing me some uh, time and money here. So... <laughs> Um, it was, uh, after not only, uh, you Gerald, but, um, you started to bring more, mm-hmm. right? So as soon as you were kind of not only going through coaching because you reached out for it, mm-hmm. that's another topic, reach out for coaching, ask mm-hmm. for coaching, but so you reached out for it and within a few months and you started having your success. But then you weren't quiet about it either. So you told everybody, hey, you got to get in here. You got to do this, right? Just like mm-hmm. just like I did back then. And um, the mm-hmm. night we came together and thought about creating a nonprofit where we could do this. Like we could do boot camps. Mm-hmm. We could do this. We could do that. Um, and it was just all more of like, hey, let's keep doing all this good stuff that we're doing. It's just... And so thus was the start of the Nitro Foundation. Mm. And um, Nitro was a name that I had rolling around in the back of my head for a while. Uh, U-R-E suffix is like a gesture, like the act of jesting, right? So mm. U-R-E is like the act of doing something. And so to me, it was like the act of being a knight, right? To get in and help someone. Yeah. And... Um, Going up in the 80s, I was always a big Knight Rider fan. Yeah. So obviously that's kind of came with it. And people who knew me have always known that I've been a, a fan of the show. Uh, and not so much for uh, anyone else but the car. It was always about Kit. the car for me. <laughs> yep. It was always about Kit and the idea of an autonomous AI mm-hmm. sidekick. <laughs> uh-huh. That's your car that you're having conversations with. Mm-hmm. And it starts to have its preferences, preferences and its likes and dislikes and things like that. And so that's what, and so that, obviously that was a show, but I, uh, the idea of being a knight, helping people where they needed help. And in this way, it was like, hey, I, you know, I can coach. I'm already doing that in other areas of my life. Here's something that I do well. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what, so we started that. We put together a program um, and it's been going for. Um, a little over four years now. Awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. We've, we've had more than 50 people come through the program now. Um, I'd say out of that number, at least 18, 16, 18 folks have, yeah. in fact, landed jobs. You know, some come, some go. The thing is, is we designed this program so it would be self, you have to be self-motivated. We can't, yeah. we're here to coach you. I'm not here to train you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. So, when folks come to us, we say, hey, go take this Khan Academy thing. Mm-hmm. Do, it's free, HTML, JavaScript, get through that. Um, and then when you're done, come back. 
I love that. Um, there's a lot of folks that don't come back. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost, it's just like a, what's what? it called, a fleece test or something? Yeah. Well, I, it's <laughs> actually part of, the, I ma- you know, we decided to make this part of the journey. I said, all right, now when you're done with it, if you hated it, tell me you hated it. Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. loved it, tell me you loved it. All right. And then once they completed it, I can see, okay, they're self-driven enough to get this far. I, as a coach, will invest my time into them. Absolutely. Because everything we do is absolutely no charge. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely free. Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually not done a good job at all raising any money for the Nitro Foundation. <laughs> it's been uh, you know, a lot of funding. Uh, we've got uh, some other small donors uh, along the way uh, and then uh, a sponsorship on an individual, um, which has been a new thing for us. And it's great. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, the starting the foundation for my career even though there's a lot of major things that happened, it was definitely one of those big milestones, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Because now you're having impact on, on a lot of people. And then when I was in pre-sales and then later sales, that was a great conversation topic, right? People want to say, hey, how's the foundation going? Or how are, you know, and you, you'd always have a story to tell about exactly. somebody that's doing well, mm-hmm. right? And people love to hear that. Um, and so uh, I always found that that always came uh, came around and um, NITRO Foundation now is uh, looking to actually put out some more of its own open source okay. projects right uh, and resources that we've we've received from uh, AWS and Microsoft and others that we then give to the same, you know, to those who work with us. Um, and we get in after that person gets through that first stage, I guess if you go to nitro.org, there's also a page about the journey, but right after that, we do a big whiteboard where I say, okay, here's how the internet works. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm going to explain the whole thing. When you go in your browser and you go to, uh, I love selling 3d print art com this website that you made and you got it hosted on the server that's all mm-hmm. you know and when i type it in how's it get there and so i describe in that it's about a half hour basically how it goes out to your own internet router how your isp works how it looks it up for dns how that goes out to the main name servers how that finally found finds it from a networking perspective how that again drops down into the network a server a, a web server a database and then automate that, that's DevOps, and we draw that picture, and here's where security comes into play, here's where automation, right? And then draw the whole thing all the way back, and by the end of the half hour, remember, these people have only just gone through Khan Academy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure you remember the first time you saw it. You're like, all right, that's a lot of information. <laughs> mm-hmm. However, then what I asked them, now out of that story, while a lot of it may have seemed confusing, what interested you the most? And I've, I've had folks really surprise me. Hmm. They're like, well, I like, I want to do some of that mobile apps stuff. I'm going to do the security or I want to do agile. Like they, but they're able to pick it out from the board now that they see how all this stuff relates. Because usually when they like, I want to get in IT, but there's a whole spectrum of jobs. They don't understand what the roles are, who does what, what goes in what sequence, which one am I going to like? Mm-hmm. I don't know. And it's, it's, it's too scary to start. So by putting them through the, the Khan Academy, you're like, all right, see, that wasn't scary. That was, that was mm-hmm. cool. Now I draw this big picture. And, it's trying to, and I, I like to have those sessions in small groups, three, four, yeah. or five people, not a lot. And have when they start focusing on something, they'll ask questions. And when they start showing that interest, yeah, I'd like to explore that more. So then we create a, a – we, we have a lot of made already – uh, a plan for them to go, okay, go take this Udemy this, this Udacity that, this Pluralsight this, um, LinkedIn training, you know, but a coach who does cybersecurity put that together for you. Gotcha. Right? And they said, okay, based on your skills and where you're at, I think you want to take this networking 101 first, then you're going to do this, you know, and create the stack. And when you get here, let me know. Ping me if you got any questions. But when you get to completion of this, uh, come back to me. We'll talk about it. I've had folks go through cloud 
who were like, you know what? I really liked the scripting side when I was doing this PowerShell stuff or the Bash shell scruff. And can I do more of that? And you're like, yeah, sure, we can pivot. Yeah. You know, it all applies. Mm-hmm. And uh, get them on that path, right? And But because we've been tracking these paths now uh, through the foundation, um, we're able to kind of like pull these cards on Trello. We have pull a card, pop it on there, you know, so we can, we're using that, you know, to help coordinate that. Yeah, that's um, huge. Especially for free. Like that that's something that does not go lost on me because I, I just remember... Um, in a similar pers- perspective of how I was introduced to you, um, you talk talk about the lineage or you <laughs> training G and G training me and then how that whole thing kind of flows through. And I, I've watched that. And I, I was already in my professional career and watched that breakdown. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll go into security. That kind of sounds. I was like, no, that's not going to happen. But mm-hmm. all in all, it, it, it's important because when we do boot camps, uh, and, and I'm TAing a boot camp and I'm getting messages at one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning. Just the the being able to ask somebody. When I went through the initial boot camps, there was nobody. Mm. It was just mm-hmm. like, hey man, I'm in the middle of work, but if you come by, I might be able to answer some questions for you. So to see having how to have it for free, I keep in this mic, have it for free and to ask the questions, um, especially up front. Because the barrier to entry to people feels monumental. Like it's just this huge mountain. I'm not good mm-hmm. at math. I wasn't a computer person, and now I want to break into tech. It, it, to me, I, I've related a lot of things to music, to where people see a music artist like, okay, well, I can't sing, but I love music and I want to be in the industry. Okay, well, but there's management, there's production, there's sales, there's marketing there's so many other ways that you could be a part of it but if you weren't introduced to it as a whole in that de construction like you just mentioned then you would never know what's available to you yeah I, i'm just sitting here thinking about all of this i really like the point about needing to be willing to reach out and ask for help yeah and how to put yourself in positions to ask for help. Like the thing about NYCHA that I like is you get a, you have an opportunity to be exposed to information uh, at the level which your appetite is. So you put in some work, you, you have someone there that's willing to have a conversation with you, guide you, etc. In In real life, without a foundation or something, you have to find that on your own. Like before I met Michael, I was struggling on my own, like reading all kinds of nonsense. I, I got a few certifications like it was just I thought I wanted to be in data but I didn't know the whole picture of tech of what it was and and whether you are going to meetups locally or going to to church or whatever it is you're doing there are people around you who have experiences Mm -hmm. who have lived the life different to yours and and part of this getting into anything is just having a little bit of bravery <laughs> and being willing to approach people humbly and say, look, I don't know, get to like get to know them. The first few sentences that come up in a conversation is like, well, what do you do for work, right? And when you come across someone who's doing the things that you're interested in, say something, yeah. ask the question. Like, wow, I would love to hear more about that i'm actually interested in doing that myself and not you're gonna get rejected people are busy people don't have time but that i think is is something you have to be willing to do if organizations like what we're trying to do with nitro we try to make that a little easier for people because mm-hmm. for me i didn't grow up and have anyone in tech that i could go to so by the time when i when i met grump it was like oh he j- just happenstance it felt like almost but i still view it as a blessing that someone with this wealth of knowledge and experience could actually point me in a direction, <laughs> could, mm-hmm. could point me and say, go, go this way. Cause I didn't even know a direction to go in at the time. But as I meditate on that, and I think about this is I, I, I feel like a lot of people don't have the audacity and combined audacity with the follow through, right? Like you hear someone might do something and you say, but you're too afraid to say, Oh wow, I'm really interested in that. You know, could could I take you out for a cup of coffee and just pick your brain? Or Is could I get on Zoom? 
Yeah, audacity is like the the gumption. The gumption. You know? Yeah. You know, just the the it, it does. It takes a little audacity. It does take a little audacity. That's a, I suppose it, that's kind of with with bravery. Yeah. Like it, you have to be a little courageous. You have to be willing to put yourself out there a little bit in order to put yourself in a position to even gain a mentor. And then once you get that, because having a good mentor is so hard yeah. to find. Having someone is so hard to find. Once you once you're in that position, you better perform. That was my thing. When when I found <laughs> Crump, I was like in a position where I was looking for over a year and I was grinding on my own. And I, I found Michael and he was able to point me in a direction. I wanted to show so much initiative yeah. and so much hunger that he was blown away by just what I did without even having to be told. Mm-hmm. What I don't like, <laughs> what I don't like, and what I've seen with people, and I'm not talking about the folks that are like, oh, that sounds cool, but then life gets in the way, and they go about, you know, they just don't have the time for it. Yeah. Kids, like normal things in life, that's cool. That's what the, the filler test is for. Do you have the capacity to even take this on? But once you decide, you say, oh, and I do have the capacity, and I do want to take this on, and I do make this commitment, then you just stagnate and you don't put in the work and you don't put in the effort and you don't put in the time even though you have this direction because or to me you don't really appreciate difficult. it yeah don't give up Did yeah. I ever tell you this story? the struggle is the education absolutely yeah. 100% they ever tell you the story about how like Gerald like read us our rights at, <laughs> at Duke you know? oh so, man <laughs> this would be fun so <laughs> It's me, me and another gentleman come out the first boot camp and we're, we're placed, we're working. Now, mind you, and I think he understood this. And as I progressed in my professional career, I don't think he cared. And I don't think I would care. But I do think he, he knew and saw that our heads were spinning. This was so much more information than we were prepared for. We had two and a half weeks of like actual instruction with like three weeks of like whatever I could pull off the internet before I could like sneeze and look up. They were just like, hey, they want you to come into work on this date. So a month or two pass and starting to make some new money. Me, me and this other gentleman, we're feeling like real like cushy and lush. And, you know, like the, the day starts around eight, we're strolling like 805. We got my breakfast sandwich and the bang energy to help with the headaches I'm getting from all this development. And <laughs> one day I'm seething right now. Thank you. <laughs> like I'm, I'm getting angry again <laughs> thinking about this. We're just like by the guard. Now, mind you, we're like we're performing for what performing means for us. Mm. We have very low expectations and everything that they hand us. We're doing, but we're doing it very lackadaisical. And one day he's literally just sitting there. He's just like, stop what you're doing. And we're just like, okay, what's up, man? And he was just like, I don't know how exactly to say this. So I'm going to be very <laughs> direct with the both of you. Like, all right, you're not working hard enough. And I was like, I go home with a headache every day. What are you talking about? I'm not working. He's like, if I'm beating you here, you're not working hard enough. If I'm leaving after you, you're not working hard enough. You have an opera it is like a sound bite that they use like a lot in like music. Like you're in a privileged position to learn a thing or two. Take advantage of it. You're being paid to learn. You're, you're being paid to learn, learn. And it was right there in that moment where I was just like, because I, I come from a world, now mind you, we were contract at that moment. I didn't know exactly what contract work really felt like or looked like. I didn't realize that at the end of this that they could really just be like, hey, man, appreciate you for those six months. And it would not affect them at all. So right there in that moment, it was just like, okay. So still, like I was going to continue to beat my head against the proverbial like tech wall. So I just had to find other ways to be valuable in those moments. That's actually kind of what led me to Agile. Like... We had more than enough minds to develop. Our process was garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, they were handing out that red Bible that Jeff Sutherland twice in the <laughs> twice to work in half the time book. 
I think I got the book around probably here somewhere. somewhere around here. They were just <laughs> handing them out. And I was just like, sure, mm-hmm. I'll read it. And as I was reading, I was like, this, there's a lot of stuff here that could help us. So, like, I read the book. I started implementing the stuff. And before I looked at it, they were just like, hey, you know that thing you're doing for your team? And I was like, sure. Like, we want you to do it for six of our teams. And then that split into what I currently am. So, it, it's those type. But I also know that he knows now, although he won't stop. You can't have, like, that level of conversation with everybody. Which mm-hmm. is why I, I really appreciate and believe in that, that filler or that filtering that you guys do with that initial course. Because you know how word of mouth travels. This is a, a new come up and, and look for a lot of people. So people hear, oh, like there's, there's money to be made here. And they just run to it. And they expect you to kind of hand them a lot. But mm-hmm. you guys just kind of put it in their hands. Like, and I'm not going to do this for you. No, I, exactly. I'm not. And, and I, I've made that mistake. I have made that mistake where I'm literally spending hours on Zoom. I'm reading books with people. I'm helping people do their tests. And then, then it's like, have you ever seen the movie Mean Girls? It's been a long time. It's been a, that's one of my favorite movies. This <laughs> is a very a quote. It's a classic quotable movie. I don't and, even know if I've seen the whole thing or not. Oh, you got to. Got Tina Fey. Lindsay plays Lohan at her finest. Absolutely. Tina 100%. Fey, too. I'm a very big Tina Fey fan. And Tina Fey has Did a line. Say- Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay Lohan. Yes, I said like Lindsay Lohan. Trapp, it's that Lindsay, much of a throwback. Because it was downhill from there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was at the max. Absolutely. That yeah, was that at was the top, peak. Top level Lindsay For sure. Lohan. But, I mean, poor girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we'll celebrate. We'll take the time to celebrate yeah. the greatness I hope here. She's yeah. doing, I hope she's doing well. I hope she's doing well, too. <laughs> the concern right? in his voice. That's just true. It was such father. genuine concern. You should have the same concern. I do, I do but I know. I know. I'm not as concerned as what Crump was. I love it. I hope she's fine. Right, it was a, it was a <laughs> subtle whisper, right? That it got came me. The depths of yeah, the heart. I love it. But I'm Tita, not gonna talk bad about it. I don't no, know. No, no, no. Yeah. Tita Fey has a line because like she's like a struggling, she's like a really smart student, but like she's getting involved with the wrong crowds. She goes, "Katie, I'm a pusher. You know what that means? I'm gonna push you to as far as you can go." And I felt that like in my life, where I'm just like, when you tell me you want something, I if I know how to get it to you. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure you're in position to get that thing. But when you decide you no longer want it, you have to let me know. And, and I've had to kind of create those same filters where people come to me, oh, because especially, you know, with Agile, everybody always say, oh, this is the easy way. Oh, I don't have to code. I don't have to do any hard work. Okay, just I'll get a scrum cert and I'll just roll through it. And it's just like, Corey, can you help me? And I'm just like, cool, read this. And then I'll check back in three weeks. Like, hey, man, did you ever read that? Oh uh, man, I haven't got to it. And in my mind, I go, "You've pushed, check." Yeah. Hey, just give me a call when you, when you go with that. No, you're, it's legitimately a thing. Oh, I yeah, make a yeah yeah go ahead. Because you put out there a movie quote, indeed. <laughs> and you it sounds like you're standing behind this as a. Would you say that is your best IT relevant movie quote? And you can't use Office Space. For me, yes. I'm a, I'm a pusher. Right. I'm 100% a pusher. Do you pusher. have a movie quote that defines, that just speaks to something to you or IT or what you should be in IT in this career? It's not a, it's not a movie. Mine, <laughs> it's not a movie, and I can't think of a direct quote on the spot, but it was from, uh, well, I'm not remembering, the Hacker Show, the new one, the newish one. That was Mr. On, Robot. Yeah, Mr. Robot. Uh, he's just like a very relatable level of weird <laughs> that I enjoy. And like how he kind of shuns everyone outside of himself. Pretty sure he's autistic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. I, I just, I feel like I... Which is totally fine, but it just re- de- no, defines the character. Yeah. I, that's all you're going to get. He's I not going to focus on anybody else. Yeah. And I wish I could do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, I, like, I feel like I can't because of the level of it was commitment also very I self-destructive have. self-destructive for him. Yeah, there yeah, was a lot of, of negative sides. But I think that, that that tells a very, it's almost like a, um, a warning story about where you can get to in tech if you're not careful. <laughs> like, I understand he was autistic. I understand that he had limitations. So it drives you crazy. It will take you to the place where you might, in fact, be insane and see a guy having conversations with him 
in your mind like Mr. Robot. Yeah. Mm. No, I think there's legitimately a level of obsessiveness. Because yeah. truly, every programmer or any architect has an inner voice, and you're having conversations with somebody to sort this thing out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 100%. So I get that. 100%. And, and it's almost like, hey, it's almost a reminder, like... Go touch some grass. Like, yeah. <laughs> go see the sun. Yeah. Go see the go, sun. Go for a walk. What you know? day is it? <laughs> because I think it's glorified, but it's also like you don't want to be that. You don't want to get there. And I think it's very easy once you trigger a certain level of obsessiveness to get there, to be there. And that's that's kind of what I'm a little afraid of. Not as much now, but definitely before. I think companies weaponize and reward that too. That's 100%. Where it, it gets kind of scary. Where they, they want you to be that but then they'll preach like work-life balance and all those other things. Yeah. I've, it's interesting hearing both of your different movie quotes and I see it in your personality, <laughs> how that's ringing true to you somewhere deep down. Mm-hmm. I'm a mean girl. And as I compare <laughs> my own, I'm nervous about myself now. Oh, I got to know now. You got to yeah, say absolutely. it. The suspense has been built. So... <laughs> There's still a period of my career I hadn't gone through, and, and, and a lot of it had to do with sales and selling software and actually getting into sales and pre-sales, and all that was great. Did well at it. Um, and maybe it'll be a whole other episode. We'll talk about entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Don't have to get into all that. But um, my there's a movie that I latched on to early on that was a very um what do you call it private label movie at first it was Mm -hmm. college students put this together and it got picked up and it was just like only on dvd right and it became now mind you i was following this thing when that thing first hit dvd (laughs) and i was like what is that The, the the cover caught my eye it was a dude holding up a martini glass and I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so my roommates, we watched this movie Swingers mm. so many times. I can. Uh, it is one of my top enjoyments <laughs> to watch the movie and explain it to people yeah. and go with the lines and go with the flow. Like it, like it is not a great. For children, per se, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's not a violent movie. Mm. It is, uh, but it is a very well written. Gotcha. And um, it is Vince Vaughn, mm-hmm. John Favreau, mm. and a whole bunch of them. This Heather Graham. This was their first movie, right? Guys in film school. Mm-hmm. And they put themselves in these situations. Because remember, I wanted to get in the film. I wanted to get into production. Mm-hmm. And so when I watched it, I'm like, that is exactly the camera angles, the timing, the mm-hmm. editing, the sound. That is how I would have made that movie. It, so uh, it just rang with me, right? Just, just It wasn't even the content. It was just... It was there, right? Mm-hmm. So that's probably what Mean Girls did for you. Absolutely. I don't know. But there's a line in the movie that I have, uh... should I pause? Yeah, pause for a second. And I leave you on a cliffhanger. (laughs) This is a good part, I don't want to miss this part here. They weren't meant to go over an hour and a half. I want to make sure I, can, I, I might have accidentally kicked something out of there. I want to make sure I'm not the reason. <laughs> Your elbows are pink. Oh. It's not a problem. take <laughs> so there's a specific line in the movie and it almost like took me through like a lot of things in my life 
Because in the in the movie, the guy Mikey, right, Mike, had gone through a breakup and all these other things, and his buddy's really just trying to get him out there, trying to encourage him. That's what it's all saying. It's like he's depressed. Mm-hmm. He's trying to get him out there, right? And uh, <laughs> he says, as he's then trying to, you know, connect him with a, a girl, and he says, uh, "It's Vince Vaughn." Puts his hand on Fevro's shoulder, my shoulder, and he goes to the girl. He goes, you see this guy over here? I want you to pay attention to this guy. This is the guy behind the guy behind the guy. <laughs> and she goes, uh, yeah, whatever. Right, and she walked off. <laughs> right? Anyway, they ended up. <laughs> and then he's like, why did you do that for? He goes, it was money, man. It was money. Anyway, it was. It was but that line specifically for myself, it's like, yeah. I don't need to be the guy. Exactly. I'm the guy behind the guy behind the guy. Yeah. Mm. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> right? That I'm, I don't need to be the face. I picked up another line from uh, the software company I was the CTO for, the owner for that company. Right? <laughs> he would always say, I need to hire people that are taller, smarter, and better looking than me. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right? And to this day, I'm going to hire people that are taller, smarter, and better looking than me. There you go. Hey. Good All right. Got two of them now. Anyway, so, so the problem is I can't afford them now. Right. <laughs> I'm going to let him choose which two. Too. <laughs> but it's interesting out. how yours, you, know, you said you're a pusher. Yeah. Yours, you know, uh, your focus was really on like, where is this going to take my, you know, my mental health? Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. This fear. Because I'm willing to jump yeah. off that cliff. How close, you know, how I was, close I can I so get? Ready. How close can I, I was, get to that I was just jumping jump off it? <laughs> but mine is like, I don't need to be the guy, but I'm yep. the guy that makes that guy really good. Exactly. Right? Um, I think one of the reasons that uh, I and the salesperson that I worked with, uh, Anthony Barkley, I uh, love giving him a plug. Um, <laughs> great mentor for me, and he's doing great things well now. And um, my job was to make him successful. Mm-hmm. That's how I viewed my job. It wasn't about me. It was about making him successful. That's the leading up. And by doing that, trust me, I made good money doing it. Exactly. Right? So you will be fine. If you focus on helping this guy or even the president of the company or the CEO, whoever it is you report to, one or two levels above, whatever, focus on making them really looking really good because mm-hmm. then they get promoted and guess who's going to move in? Right. Over they're, mm-hmm. they're a trusty right-hand man. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, that's another little yeah. bit. That makes sense. Yeah, that just make sure the middle one's running. Because the cool. uh, all the side ones are turning off. Yes, they are. Gotcha. So let's let's go ahead and well, we're gonna. I want to wrap up with the closing statements because we still have the middle camera going. Yeah, I was gonna see if you want to do a quick as we um, wrap a quick pivot to you got vehicle that you brought alongside of you. Anything going along? Yeah, I mean, I won't get in too much. Um, I've always, as an architect, and I, you know, I've always been a bit of an idea guy. I have a patent in the private cloud space with Verizon. Um, it wasn't the first thing I've ever invented, like the corporate portal I talked about before. It's not the last. Mm-hmm. Um, an architect has to be creative and be, have ideas. So, Reacle just, you know, came out of Nitro. Nitro effectively is incubating this as a project and then launching it with folks whom have also come from the foundation. So we're able to help those folks get job skills, awesome. right, as well. Uh, doing programming development, um, even others who are mid-career, right, want to come mm-hmm. into this project, continue to add on to their skills. And this was an idea that I had thinking, uh, when you get into a car accident, and they decide to total you out, why do they do that? Mm-hmm. Why are they going to pay me all this money for this busted car? Mm-hmm. And it was just one of those questions. So I decided to look into it more and more and more over the years and found that, hey, these salvage companies are making a lot of money on this car. Yeah. And I've always uh, been on the uh, frugal side at times. And my wife as well, um, We've always uh, liked, enjoyed our consignment sales yeah. or bringing stuff to the consignment, right? Uh, everybody knows consignment. Mm-hmm. And so my thought was, how do I, m- what if we were to put these two together? So that just kind of started a process of looking into the industries, 
of thinking, is there enough money on the table when breaking down a vehicle to do it on consignment, mm -hmm. to split the money with the owner of the vehicle that brings it to you? And I started going on that rabbit hole, right? So now I'm thinking business process, what's going to make this thing valuable? Well, they're only going to give me their car if I can tell them how much their car is worth exactly. in parts. Yeah. So uh, we came up with a process to do a valuation through scripts and through reaching out for data on the internet and crawlers and all that kind of stuff to come up with a low level kind of general appraisal of what we believe that car is worth in parts. Mm -hmm. Now this year um, we are launching a new app actually for the public, not just for us, but the same capability. Really? So that others can download the app and we call it the vehicle inner track app, having nothing to do with consignment, but just the ability of the idea of appraising a vehicle by its total sum in parts, which is much higher than it is via retail or resale or what have you. And then so that if somebody gets into an accident and maybe they don't have full coverage and they're stuck with this busted car, what are they going to do with it? How do they know what this thing is really worth? Yeah. Or you go to take your car to trade it in and they're only offering you two grand and you're like, uh, let me run this app. This thing's worth like nine grand in parts. You can sign this thing or do mm -hmm. what have you, right? Um, so that app is, so there's obviously it supports the vehicle consignment business, but it's applicable, that app, that data we're finding to many others. Gotcha. So other salvage yards whom don't have the technical expertise, which are most, when they go to buy salvage vehicles that they know how much is that car worth, what should I be buying it on, mm. right? There is software out there, but that, that kind of does it, but it usually depends on the database that that company already has and what they've already done, right? There's not a good general industry standard mm -hmm. um, to bring me back via a VIN number, what is my car worth in parts, right? And so we believe that that data is also valuable to the insurance companies, yeah. salvage yards, auto body shops, um, the app itself will be a free download. Your first VIN search will be free uh, with a subset of data and then the ability to upgrade from there. It's awesome. Sweet. Fantastic. We enjoyed having you on. Uh, of course, we'd love to have you on again at some point. Anything you're talking about these topics, but it was fun. Absolutely. Any closing statements? You good? No, just keep quality in mind and read. That's where yeah. I'm always going to end. <laughs> hey, read. Yeah. All right, y'all. We will see y'all next week. Have a good one. Absolutely. Appreciate you.